name is Kevin Waddell. I'm with Burns McDonald. Uh, I'm the pre-construction manager for our water global practice. And what that means is I'm actually in our division we call construction design build. I don't know, many of you may not know this, but Burns Mac actually builds $2 billion a year in construction. So we are a contractor. Um, and my sole purpose in life is to support our water level practice. My specialty has been water, wastewater facility and infrastructure pretty much my whole career. So my, my expertise, I guess, is the estimating and pre-construction for water, wastewater, infrastructure, and facilities. So that's my focus. And uh, get started on today's little presentation. Um, I am a professional engineer I'm with the University of Kansas. I've got about 26 years experience in estimating, conceptual estimating, construction costs, reviews, uh, tracking, and, and then leading estimating teams in the pursuit of cool, exciting projects. So what we're going to do today is kind of take a deeper dive into some inter intermediate estimating. I kind of tailored this a little differently, and I hope it goes over well. I know it's titled Intermediate Takeoffs, but really, all of you at this level, I'm sure, know how to do quality takeoffs. So I didn't want to spend a lot of time on that. I mean, there's not. There's no complicated quantity takeoff system, right? It's either linear area, volume, ton, pound, right? So um, the advance of quantity takeoffs has really has to do with BIM and all those classes. So I kind of steered this in a little, a little different direction. But my whole focus and what I tell people is I'm wired to win. And I think to be an estimator uh, and be successful in estimating, you need to be wired to win, if that makes sense. So. Real quick, just a quick kind of back step. What is cost of estimating? You look at this formula and you go, what is going on here? This is crazy stuff. Basic definition of cost estimating is the approximation of the cost of a program, project, or operation. And to take that a step further, there's a new, kind of a newer profession they call cost engineering. I really don't know much about it. I think it's just a fancy way of calling this estimators. But anyway, there's a, there's a profession you can go to school for and learn called cost engineering. Um, so take that for this work. In my experience um, in, in dealing with younger estimators and helping train estimators and, and teaching them what I do or don't know, uh, I've come across what I think make up some characteristic, characteristics of a good estimator. One, obviously you need experience, right? Because you look around and say, well, how do I get that experience? And that's by getting with a company that will allow you to be in the field for a part of your career, right? I don't think you can be a good estimator unless you spend time in the field and you either build something or watch something being built. You have to have education of some kind, right? High school, college, doesn't matter, but you have to be able to do basic math, right? Some basic uh, interpolation skills. I think personality is a big part of it. If you like to sit at a desk all day and crunch numbers, um, you may be a very good estimator, but you may not advance your career or you may not do the exciting things that uh, some estimators get to do. I think you, obviously you guys know this, you have to be organized, right? You have to have some sort of ability to be organized. In this day and age, it's all about computers. 25 years ago it was not. It was still, we were still using paper and pen and, and scratching things out. So but today it's all about computers. And then I think you got to be self-motivated. Um, you got to want to learn. You got to want to reach out. You gotta to want to be able to ask questions and get uncomfortable with yourself. One thing I'll tell people all the time is, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I don't claim to be, never will be. And I don't know everything, but I know who to call, right? I know who to call, because I've built relationships and I trust those people and they trust me. So if I don't know something, I don't pretend like I do and I won't tell a client or anybody that I know it, I'll say, I'll get you that answer and I will. So to me, those are kind of the good characteristics of a good estimator. And then uh, understanding your costs, right? Know your costs, and then cost versus price. Can anybody tell me real quick what cost, what the difference between cost and price is? Anybody? Cost is your, what your actual, you know, it's gonna take a million dollars to do this, but price, you're gonna probably mark it up to get some exactly. revenue out of it. Your cost is what it actually costs you to perform that work. Your price is what you tell the owner what it's worth, right? It's your markup overhead, and we'll get into that in a little bit here. So there's a big difference. And understand that when you in the terminology, cost versus price. So real briefly, what is an estimator? I mean, it's lots of things. I, I personally don't think it's it required just to crunch numbers. I mean, you're a little bit of a business developer, right? You're out there, you're meeting the clients, you're meeting other the, the GCs or 
whatever your industry is, and you're kind of that frontline person, you're catching mistakes early, right? You're kind of a mistake eliminator. You're looking at plans. You see stuff that may not be right, and you're bringing it to somebody's attention very early in the process. You may write proposals. You're solving problems, right? Because you're trying to figure out how am I estimating this? How am I going to build this project? So you're solving problems. So we're more than just number of people. So let's dive into estimating methods and types real quick. There, there are a lot of different ways to estimate projects, right? And here, here's just a handful of them. So there's the old unit price method. You know, you may work for a guy who's my age, an old fart, that just knows, hey, it costs $10 a foot to run this trim down this wall at this height, right? Or hey, it costs $5 a square foot to do this and that and the other. And so there's a lot of data out there that's based on metrics of of something per unit, right? A lot of people estimate that way. I, I don't. So at times we might, if we're, if we're doing budgeting and things like that, or if we're trying to give somebody just a real quick uh, high level, hey, what do you think this is going to cost? We may throw out a, a you know, something per unit. But at, for at-risk estimates, we, we generally don't estimate that way. Another way to estimate is using historical data. Some of your companies may have records that they've kept over the years and know exactly what it costs to do certain tasks, right? How much, is it, how much does it cost to hang this four by eight sheet of plywood? Or how much does it take to lay an eight inch piece of pipe in a ditch? So some companies have that. In my career, I found like, most companies have not done a good job of capturing that data and it catches up to them at the end. So as you come up through your career and you build your career, look around and see what your company's doing and see if there's a way maybe you can help facilitate capturing real data, real data, real productions from the field, whether it's using timesheets or having you know, your project managers, PMs, form and report back to you in some, math, in some method. But capturing that historical data will, will absolutely help you down the road if you can get it. Uh, another way to estimate is through a database. Um, you know, the Mechanical Contractors Association, MCA, has their, has their on-site. If you're a member of that organization, you can log into a website. And they'll tell you exactly how much it takes to set a three foot long, eight foot piece of flange pipe. They'll tell you exactly how many man hours per that section will take you. They'll tell you exactly how long it takes to set a 90 degree flange bend, right? They have all that data on their website. And, and then there's various estimating softwares too that come preloaded with databases. And we'll get into that here in a minute. And there's also subscriptions. Anybody here familiar with RS Means or BNI? Richardson's kind of an unknown, but they do a lot in the industrial world, Richardson does. This is a great tool. Um, there's no doubt about it. We use RS Means a lot, but, we, but I will say this, at least in my opinion, it's not the end game, right? It's a starting point. Because this is an average of uh, across the United States. And, now, and you know, you can go into different geographical areas and specify, hey, I'm going to be in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, doing this kind of work. What's this cost? How long does it take to do this, this, and this? And it, it's different. It does vary by geographic location. So they've done a good job of trying to identify culture and, and uh, how stuff's done in different areas. But it's still, in my opinion, just a starting point. If you, if you really don't know something, really don't have the resource to find out what it takes to do something, this is good. But I use this as a starting point, And then based on information we have or experience, metrics, we kind of fact check that and say does it make sense and then we, we go from there. So great tool, but in my opinion it's not the end all be all. And then finally uh, another method is you, you, yourself, you're an estimating tool, right? You're a method, your experience, your knowledge, um, it's, that's what really drives an estimate, or at least it should in my opinion. The estimate's about you, right? And, and what you think something costs and then of course you're going to validate that and review and all that kind of stuff. Any questions on that? Is there anything else out there I missed that that's, people are doing that's different than those kind of basic categories? Okay. And, and this is interactive too. I'm not here to talk at you. I'm here to talk with you. So if you get a question, uh, just speak up. Just raise your hand and we'll stop and, and address your question. We don't have to wait till the end or anything like that. So feel free to jump in at any time. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty, pretty loose here. So. All right, there are lots of different types of estimating in my opinion, and, and you may think, well, what do you mean by that? You know, crunch numbers, you do a takeoff and you bid it. Well, 
it, depending on your situation, the company you work for, you may look at doing different types of work, different types of contract delivery methods. Um, you may get asked by an owner to give you a budget number. So there's a lot of different things to consider in estimating, but the obvious first one's a hard bid, right? Design, bid, build. You get a full set of documents, you sit down, you go through it, you do take off your, your scope, you take off your quantities, you put costs to it, put your markup, GC's overhead on it, and you send it on its way, and you try to win the job, right? So that's, that's the old school um, method that's still out there, but it's, it, it is dwindling in, in acceptance and uh, uh, in the marketplace. It is starting to dwindle a little bit. There's a GMP versus lump sum. Can anybody without reading up there tell me what the difference between a GMP and a lump sum? Well, first of all, has everybody heard of GMP? Okay, it's called guaranteed maximum price. And everybody knows what a lump sum bid is, right? Where you give them one number and say, yeah, I'll do all the work for this. Right? Some people you'll find in the industry use those terms interchangeably. They're not. There's a very real difference between the two. So uh, be aware of that. If you're in a GMP situation, a GMP is a cost plus a fee. So in other words, you're going to tell your the GC you want to work for, or your owner, that hey, this is my cost, and this is the fee I need to charge you for this work. And then within that, there's a potential for shared savings and contingency. Um, it includes a known contingency. You usually make that known because that person that's going to pay you is at risk to pay you exactly what you need to have, right, up to a certain guaranteed maximum price. So within that, they want to know, well, what kind of contingency do you have? And they don't necessarily want to overpay for that, right? There may be an opportunity to share some contingency there based on the value engineering or something like that. Whereas a lump sum, your contingency is in that lump sum. You don't share it with the owner. They don't know what it is. If you don't use your contingency, it's your money, right? Um, additional profit, whatever. Um, if you do use it, they still don't know what you use it for. They just know the job sailing along, and, and this is all I'm paying right here, this lump sum. So, there's a big difference, and so just remember that. GMP versus lump sum. Uh, there's a, what we call ROMs, rough order magnitude. We do this a lot in the industrial space. Industrial clients, when they're budgeting for their big major projects or expansions, they want to know very early on, very early on, hey, what is this roughly going to cost? And so we really pull numbers out of the sky, literally sometimes. But uh, we literally, with not much to go on except maybe a description of what the owner wants to do, tell them what we think it's worth. I mean, it could be $20, $50, 100 million dollar project. It's called a rough order magnitude. Usually, the, the, the level of accuracy is somewhere around 30, 35%, plus or minus, so they understand that the range that's, that's possible in the rough order magnitude, but they just want to know what that range is so they can start preparing their capital improvements programs, their budgets and whatnot to make sure they have money set aside. And then we do a budget, which is really kind of even before ROM. Um, a budget is like really high level, like, hey, I want to put a boiler in there. What's it going to cost? Well, what do you mean? How big a boiler? Well, I don't know. You just tell me. What do you think? You see this room? Fit a boiler in there. Tell me, oh, it happens, right? So that's a budget number. You just kind of go, well, you know, you call a boiler guy and say, hey, how much does boiler cost? And you, and you say, it's going to be roughly this amount of money, right? So budget. And it does happen. I mean, we do a lot of budgeting as well. Um, if you're not familiar with the Association of Advancement of Cost Engineering, which I'm not, <laughs> but it seems like uh, anymore we're getting a lot of requests whether they want a class one or class two or class three, class four, class five estimate. I encourage you to just go look it up and read the descriptions of what those are. The class one is basically the equivalent of a hard bid. Class five would be the equivalent of a budget. Okay, and then there's levels in between. We actually went into a presentation for an, a design project, but the owner wanted at some point along the way to know what the cost of this project would be and they add, they're asking for a level four cost estimate. So um, it's, you see it more often and it's starting to gain some traction for whatever reason, but just you might look that up and kind of be familiar with what a class one through five estimate is. Then we also do a lot of 30, 60, 90% estimates. By that I mean we get plans that are 30% developed, we get plans that are 60% developed, we get plans that are 90% developed and we're expected to develop cost estimates on those. Typically, see those types of milestones in collaborative delivery projects, your design builds, your progressive design builds, CMRs, CMGC contracts, right? Where an owner wants to know very early on what, how the cost is trending and what, uh, what this project is going to be worth by the time you get to your GMP. And then uh, you may hear the term at risk. Maybe you haven't. Does anybody know what that means? Just basically means. 
I'm sorry? It doesn't sound good. Yeah. It just basically means the number you're giving me, you're at risk to build it, right? So a lot of times you'll hear people say, hey, we're giving this client an at-risk number. In other words, it's a real number. When we turn it in, they're gonna expect us to build it for that. So it could be a it could be a 30, 60, 90, it could be a GMP, it could be a, a budget, believe it or not. But if the owner says, hey, we want you to be at risk, that's what that means. And then there's conceptual, which is kind of a combination of a lot of these different ones. You know, ROM is a conceptual estimate, budgets are conceptual. 30, 60, 90s have some element of conceptual conceptualization in that, and we'll talk a little bit more about conceptual estimating in just a minute, because I think it's pretty important in what we do. So, any questions on that? I got one. Is there anything different that I may have missed? So let's see. So let's say you're doing like a CM at risk, but doesn't that usually have like a GMP with that associated with it? So I guess where does the at risk part come in? Because if you can only you can only bill for X dollar amount or lump sum, then I guess where's the where's the risk part at? Besides saying I'm gonna build it for what well, I told you. Well that's what for. it means. So then uh, so when you turn that GMP in, it, I kind of doubled up on some things there, but it's just different ways of saying the same thing. Gotcha. Um, at risk does not mean GMP, that's not what I mean. But if you were accept a GMP price, turn one in and the owner says, Okay, go do it, and you say, All right, sign the dotted line, you're now at risk to build it. Gotcha. Okay. Does that make sense? In other words, it's, it's on you now. It's incumbent upon you. All the risk is yours to go build that job for that price. That makes sense? That's assuming nothing changes, right? Or like with that aspect risk. How does that? It depends on what type of contract it is. <laughs> now. So you're getting into a lot of different discussions, and that's fine. We can go down this path. But uh, oh, no, GMP is a GMP. The only way you would be able to get any additional money is if they whole change the scope and said, hey, we're, we're going to add this whole other building to your scope understanding it's not in your price now, it's not in your GMP, give us a price to do that. But some little change along the way that happens that maybe you didn't foresee, that's on you. Because you said, owner, I'm going to guarantee I'm, I'm going to build this job for this price, no matter what happens in between, aside from major scope changes. Does that make sense? It does. Uh, well, I'm going to talk risk. about risk here just a little bit. That's, this is where I'm going with this thing. I, I took this a little different. Right twist and just talking about quantities and takeoffs and all that stuff. All so, up on the question. But yeah, I'm yeah. Open, but absolutely, I'm open for any questions now and we can continue this discussion if you want to, but we are going to talk about risk a little bit here. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? All right, let's just real quickly touch on uh, some tools that are out there um, as we morph into some other things. So technology-wise, and I know a lot of these people are here or, or, or talking about some of this stuff. Um, there's plan for takeoffs, for quantity takeoffs, there's Plan Swift, uh, OST, which is on screen takeoff. Some people are using Bluebeam. How many people are using Bluebeam? A lot? Not for takeoffs. Yeah, no. Not for takeoffs, yeah. But who, who's using it for takeoffs? Do you like it? Yeah. You okay with it? I struggle with it. I really do. Yeah, yeah I, I do. I prefer like a Plan Swift. Plan Swift's my favorite, and that's what I use. But we also have on screen takeoff at Burns Mac. A lot of guys use that and gals. But I struggle with Bluebeam just because I know it's, a lot of people are using it and there's a lot of training classes on it, but it just seems like it's a little cumbersome to me. If you've used another one and see what another one can do that's different, so it's just my opinion. But it's out there, a lot of people use it. Uh, and it's cheap. Yeah, right. It's cheap. It's very inexpensive. So. Um, as far as like estimating softwares on the mechanical and electrical side, there's AccuBid by Trimble, and it actually has several different modules, some mechanical, some electrical. Um, our electrical estimators use a program called Conest, which they really seem to like. I don't know anything about it, but they like it. Um, and then to, to kind of get a little bit bigger and expand out globally, there's Hard Dollar, which is actually owned by Kiwit. Um, they, they bought it years ago and sunk a lot of money into it to morph it the way they wanted to morph it. And, but it's, it's available for anybody to purchase, and it's a very powerful program a lot of it's, it's hard to learn to use it takes a lot of intense training and time up front um, then there's ACSS heavy bid which I've used which I like it's a good program but again some training intensive stuff and then there's others I'm vaguely familiar with but haven't used a lot there's Winest uh, Sigma estimates which I know has been at this conference before and, and an excellent program actually I've researched a little bit and, and would highly recommend if you're looking for a, a fairly inexpensive easy to learn estimating software, so I think it's pretty good. And then there's Sage or Timberline, which um, we're, we're starting to use at Burns and Mac and trying to figure out some ways to 
to use it with BIM and assemble and things like that. So, and then of course there's Excel spreadsheets which we still use too. So. How many people just use Excel? What, what's anybody else using? Do you mind telling me? Stage. Pre-built. Huh? Pre-built. Pre-built? Okay, I've never heard of that Stage. One. Sage. DHS. Timberline. Anything Cost else? X. Cost X. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot out there. It seems to be that the estimating software choices have really blown up in the last five years. I mean, a few years ago, just pretty much the names are on that board. But, uh, it's really grown. So interesting. A lot of different, a lot of different ways to estimate. Uh, scheduling, you know, there's pretty much two that are in the industry. Asta. 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 Asta is a new one. What What's that program? Like scheduling. Just yeah. Just like P6. Just like P6. Yeah. 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 Who, who backs that? I'm sure one of the. Asta. It's just an Asta program. And yeah. I know like Construct Connect buying everything and they back everything now. So I was wondering if it was like one Not of the yet. programs. Not yeah. Actually, they're a UK company. Yeah. Okay. UK, but yeah, we bought it. You like it? Yes. Yeah. Very, very easy to work. Oh, nice. A lot less expensive than a premium version. Oh, premium very expensive. Yeah. I like Microsoft Project for doing quick, down, dirty little pre-con schedules. Just quick little stuff. Maybe you know, 20, 30 items real fast. Uh, high level schedule. I like Microsoft Project for stuff like that. But yeah, P6 very expensive. So. And then of course, you know, believe it or not, social media. You know, you can advertise and. <laughs> Get a hold of people through LinkedIn and Twitter and, and get your quotes and stuff. It's kind of crazy how social media has found its way in everything. But, uh, and then databases, right? There's all kinds of, uh, like we talked about earlier, RS Means, Richardson, uh, DNI. So, so let's talk just a minute about conceptual estimating, and, and this will grow on the next couple slides as we expand into some other topics, but uh, ha how many of you have ever done a conceptual estimate, or do you know what I mean by conceptual estimating? What, what, in your opinion, what's conceptual estimating? We, um, we do a lot of municipal work, so it's mainly just kind of going with historical enterprise. Yeah. Based on what? Somebody giving you a plan? Yeah. Okay. Most of ours is hard, like 100% playing with that work. Okay. That's I mean, not really conceptual estimating, I'll tell you why. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's conceptual estimating for like a tank farm, farm down in uh, Cushing, Oklahoma for a uh, Enbridge, um, where basically they say, hey, we, we might have a few of these motors, and we're going to set some tanks right here. All right, right. you got to figure out the rest, and we got yeah. to understand the devices and the motors and stuff like that. Yeah, that's conceptual estimating, right? So conceptual estimating, if somebody comes to you, and it may be a paper napkin sketch, and I mean literally, I've had somebody draw something out and say, hey, what's that going to cost? Okay. Um, but it's literally a rudimentary drawing or a plan where you know not all the information is there, right? You just know it by looking at it. Your experience tells you, well, it doesn't have anything there. But if somebody wants you, and again, it I don't mean it's not risk price. I'm not necessarily somebody wanting you to build that after you give them a price. But somebody may need to know, I really need to know what this is going to cost before I spend any more money on engineering or try to budget it, so I really need to have an idea. That's conceptual estimating. So um, you may ask yourself, well, where do I start with conceptual? I mean, how do you even do that? Um, first thing I do is I look at I look at whatever's presented to me, identify the different scopes of work that I know are needed. Right? If somebody hands me a building shell and says, okay, here's, here's the shell of the building, and they show me some rudimentary information on the exterior or whatever, and they show me some doors and windows, what's this going to cost? I know right away I need electrical, HVAC, plumbing, painting, right? You see where I'm going with this? It's not shown. It doesn't tell me. But my history, my mind says, hey, i got to put a roof on it, right? That's conceptual estimating, right? And being able to do that is, is, is not everybody can do it, to be honest with you. I know some people that, that are, like you said, I'm not saying you are, but I'm saying like 100%. That's the only way they know how to estimate. They really struggle. And sometimes it's because of lack of experience. Sometimes it's maybe you just don't have the confidence in yourself to do it, right? So I, I, there's people who struggle with this. That's why I want to talk about it a little bit. Because if you can, if you can conceptualize, it, it'll help your entire career as far as being able to, to hard bit stuff, believe it or not. It really will, okay? Because you look at things differently if you're able to. I'm sorry? Is there much of a difference between that and the budget? No, not really. Budgeting is conceptual estimating. It really is. 
So the first thing I do is I take that building shell and I look at it and I say, well, you know, I know I need a, a concrete slab, I know I need painting, electrical, blah, blah, blah. And I just kind of list that out, right? And then I go through and I identify what I know the work tasks are based on what's on the paper. I see masonry or I see windows, I see doors, right? Those are known things that's shown on my piece of paper. And then I identify the known materials, which again, shown on this paper. If it's not known, I make some basic assumptions. You know, if they, if they show a root that's got a certain kind of hatching, I might assume it's a composite roof. If they show a root that's got lines on it, it's probably a sheet metal roof. Right? I mean, so you, you just make some, you make some assumptions, but you always be careful to document your assumptions, right? So when you go to present this conceptual estimate to whoever's requesting it, you've listed out everything that you assume, material-wise, right, the type of building, and say, this is how I arrived at this number. And then I'll review the work tasks and, and say, do I need to go get a sub number? Do I need to have an electrical you know, sub tell me, hey, this is so much per square foot or, or whatever for a building like this. So, um, and then I simply try to fill in the blanks of the detail. And if I, if I know there's a concrete slab necessary, then I'm going to look at form, pour, rebar, right, and add in that detail of how I arrive at my concrete slab cost. Okay? I don't usually use pretty hard numbers. You can, but I usually don't. So that's kind of how I, just in a nutshell, how I do. I'm not saying it's the right way, wrong way, it's the best way. It's just my experience, and, and I feel like I've been fairly successful with conceptual estimating. Those are kind of the basic high-level steps I take to make sure I capture uh, everything. And then we're going to talk a little more about this and contingency and stuff like that. Because uh, in conceptual estimating, it's not just about on that piece of paper, right? You're going to miss something. Nobody's perfect at it. So you got to have some contingency to cover the rest, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So uh, let's step back and look at an estimating process. How many of you have a kind of a standard little procedure that you follow? Anybody? If you don't, you need to get one, right? You really do. Um, it just helps helps you budget your time, helps you understand how you're going to get from point A to point B, um, understanding when your bid is due. And, and the steps necessary in between. So the first thing I do, and again, I'm, we're dealing with you know, multi-million big projects, like I've got 150 million right now that we're working on, and I'm working on the pre-construction schedule for that here in Kansas City. Um, I look at our proposals due May 1st, and we're starting now. What do I need to do in between? How do, how do I interact with the engineering team, because it's a design build? How does our pre-construction team interact with the Engineering team, engineering team interact with the owner, blah, 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 and we put all that on paper, right? And we have dates and milestones, and we try to figure out how long it's going to take to do certain tasks so we know when we need information from the engineering team in order to estimate. So um, it may not be that complicated for a lot of what you do, but still having a little timeline, right? It may not have to be a formal schedule, but just having a little timeline of, of when do I need to be done, when should I solicit myself and suppliers? We'll go a long way to making sure you're not kind of scrambling with that last minute to, to get it done. So, um, does everybody have their own estimating format? Uh, Excel spreadsheet, by discipline, by structure, or is it just kind of like you create a format every time you get a set of plans based on what's on that set of plans? Or how, just so somebody, how do you, if you were presented a set of plans today, and I laid some on your say for a road job, do you have a template already set aside to use for your estimate, or do you just create it from scratch and say, okay, based on this set of plans and this scope of work, I need this, this, this? I kind of just go off experience as far as what type of road job it is, is it even price, is it not so That's really all the work we do. Is it's, it's usually broke down by a bid form with yeah. all your different things. Yeah. price, bid form, yeah. yeah. So, so a lot of what we do is so high level, 30, 60, 90. Um, and there's no bid form, right? We're creating the bid form. So we'll, we'll roll into what I'm getting ready to talk about, a work breakdown structure, where we identify the key elements of that design or that project, and we'll assign it codes, right? And each major task will have a code called a work, an actual work breakdown structure, maybe 100, 200, 300, 400, and then your subtask would be 101, 102. And, and we do that for several reasons. Number one, because you can roll it into your schedule, your AA, I can't remember, your ASTA yes, or, or your P P6 schedule. Because your P6 schedule or and your, probably your ASTA the same way will pick up on a work breakdown structure. 
and you can roll that right into your schedule and then start to go through your schedule at the same time. Where, what, what do you use to format your breakdowns? Whatever I feel is appropriate, honestly. I mean, one you can use 10,000 numbers, 1,000 numbers, 100. As to, far as compiling the data and then being able to shift it into <coughs> one piece six or something like that. Uh, so. Because I've seen it, you know, you can create your work breakdown structure in piece six. Right. But I've never seen it, I guess, outside of it and then Excel. brought into it. I just so, use an Excel spreadsheet. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And just start typing out, based on that particular set of drawings, that plan, that project, what the major work items are. Could be an admin building, could be park, could be like civil, could be electrical. I mean, you may, it, you know, you may break it out by discipline. You may break it out. You know what I mean by discipline trait, right? right? Or you can break it out by the particular structure or work area. It's really up to you. It's whatever suits you best for how you need to deliver your estimate. There's no, there's no set way that I would tell anybody. Hey, it's how you have to do work breakdown structure. The important thing is if you're doing one on larger projects, so you can keep track of your data keep track of the flow of the estimate, right? And the other thing that does is too, if you have multiple people working on the same estimate, um, it gets them all on the same page as far as where stuff's located. In the end of the estimate, does that make sense? Is there any questions on that? Do you understand what I mean by work? And you know what, a lot, of, a lot of smaller estimates and stuff, you don't need to do that probably, right? But we're talking you know, 150 million, 200 million dollar projects here. If you got your hundred thousand dollar job, you may have two, two or three major items. You don't need to waste time doing work breakdown structure, right? I'm just kind of making you aware that that's the terminology and that's out there, and and those are the things that are done on on larger type projects. And that work breakdown structure will follow the estimate all the way to the field, right? Your field staff, your your operations team will use that work breakdown structure again, like we talked about for your P6 schedule but also to track their work in the field, identify change orders in the field, stuff like that. Um, and then, you, of course, you develop your cost system after that, right? And including your quantities, your takeoffs, your subcontractor supplier solicitations, and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and again, your pre-construction schedule kind of helps you as to when you think you need to start going out to, to the market to get your pricing. And then you've got your preliminary construction schedule. So in pre-construction, we do a preliminary construction schedule. Now we have cost controls people that are experts in P6 and all that that can help us. So I'm by no means a P6 expert. But you may be the one-man show, right? I, I've been in your boots. I've been the one-man show before. You're trying to crank out a little schedule for an owner and, and do your estimate at the same time as in your crunch down the last minute. But the owner wants to know, hey, how long is it going to take, right? So they're beating on your door. So. Um, and of course, you always schedule, at least I do. I try to make my S, my pre-construction schedules, well, let's leave it back, a preliminary construction schedules real. By that, I mean, I will build my schedule based on my estimate breakdown, my major, what kind is my estimate. So that way I can roll man hours into it, develop what my crews look like. So I'm not just saying, oh, I think it's gonna take me 30 days to do this task, I'm actually, backing into the man hours that I've developed for that task, figure out I need five guys to do 200 man hours, right? And then how long does that relate to on a schedule? So we try to make our preliminary, and again, the preliminary, and you very rarely get held to that schedule, but it's a starting point because even in the larger complex jobs, and the owner says, hey, I need this done in 90 days. And you're like, well, no way you can do that. And it's like, sure you can. Just get going, right? I mean, how many times have you heard that? You pull out your preliminary construction schedule and say, look, man, it's going to take 1,000 man hours, and I've only got five guys. It's going to take 200 days. can't be done. So it's nice to have a schedule that's real uh, for your preliminary construction schedule. Um, if you have that ability and that and the tools available to you to do that. So, And again, your durations are based on your man hours and what you think the crew size needs to be to do a certain task. So. Uh, in my estimating process, we do this all the time. We don't do a project without it. We develop a risk register. Has anybody ever done a risk register? Yeah. Did you did you put cost to the risk? Yeah. And how did you do that? Uh, it's a lot of it's based on metrics from either previous experience or we'll go out um, to contractors that we know we may be using on the project, um, develop the cost risk, and then we'll basically tell them. Okay, here's your, here's what it could be, here's your, you know, max level of risk if we have all in 
go on and use these costs this way to pay, uh, or we can give a minimum level, give them a range that we go to and let them decide if they're going to carry it or not. Perfect. At what, at what point do you develop that risk register in your estimating process? Early on, towards the end, middle? Uh, it's, we've started it as early as conceptual. Yeah. Yeah. And it basically evolves all the way through your 100% CDs. So. Yeah. It evolves, but it doesn't necessarily change. It doesn't change. necessarily change. It, it can sometimes change. Sometimes it mitigates. Yeah. Good. No, it's good. Anybody else? Yeah. Basically the same thing. Same thing. I mean, also with that, it's get to the point of, well, are you going to do a go or no go on it if you're even going to bid it? Absolutely. So sometimes you do that risk register even before you decide if you're going to bid it job, right? You know that process. So that's probably something I should have added to this estimating process. It kind of made the assumption you're already bidding it, but you're absolutely right. Every we, go no goes are huge. Anybody do go no goes? You know what we mean by that? It's a process where you get your executive team and your owner, your company, or whatever, and say, hey, I really want to bid this. And, he goes, no, 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 no. I know that owner. We're not going to work for that guy. You know, he mixes it, right? So, uh, okay. Uh, so, Rick's register, and we'll talk about that in contingency development here in, in a little more detail in just a minute. And then you got your front end document review, right? Everybody know what I mean by front end documents? So, the front end documents and a set of specifications is always your, your agreement, your general conditions, your supplementary conditions, and your insurance and your Div 1 stuff. Right? So we call those front-end documents, so you always review that right, and, and, and have that talk with ownership or whoever's reviewing your estimate. And then uh, RFIs are a big part of, of your estimating process, right? have a system for RFIs, um, track them. Right? I know it sounds, sounds corny, but they, you don't have a record of what was said in, in these days. 20 years ago, sometimes a handshake and a smile, you, you can still get away with that. But, Anymore, it seems like if you don't have a documentation of what was said and agreed upon uh, or the answer you got for a particular thing, some of them come back and say, no, I never said that. And it happens, believe me. It truly does happen. So do your request for information and keep that, keep that documented all the way through the project. So, so we touched on it a minute ago with contingency and risk. And, and again, I, I wanted to take this course in a little different direction because I feel like I know when I was coming up uh, younger, again, I don't know it all. And, Claim to know it all, but I've learned a lot, sometimes the hard way, <laughs> in the last few years. So um, I think this is something that's not really taught or mentored or explained, right? You just kind of learn on the fly. But there's some things that, that we, that I've learned and, and people have taught me uh, that are way smarter than me about risk. And, and, and so I want to talk about that a little bit. And you guys chime in at any time if this doesn't make sense or boring you or whatever, but I think this is important as you advance your estimated career to be able to do this type of stuff. So we talked about the risk register, right? First of all, do you have a risk register? And again, if you're doing a $100,000 job, the risks probably aren't very high, but um, if something does go wrong on a small job, you don't have much room for error, right? You don't have a lot of money in the project. So if something does go wrong, it hurts more, right? The dollar can mean it hurts the pocketbook a lot more than if you had to say, a hundred million dollar job if something may go wrong. There's a little cushion there. So you gotta look at risk differently, but I encourage you to always to look at the risk on the job, no matter no matter the size of the project. Because I one of my and again I'm not perfect, nobody is. I had a three hundred thousand dollar job once, it cost five hundred thousand. I didn't analyze the risk well well. So it happens, right? Now fortunately I haven't had that many of those, but it, it happens. And so you, every job deserves to have to look at the risk. So do you have a risk register? If you do, you know, evaluate your set of drawings and initially right off the bat look at it and, and list the risks. Look at it and say, well what do I think where are the gotchas on this job, right? Are you digging twenty foot deep in rock? Um, are you trying to work off scaffolding thirty foot high and set plywood or uh, set pipe? You know, what what are the risks of the job? And list those out. And then list them as whether you think that's a low, a low risk, a medium risk, or a high risk, right? And, and again, it's just your judgment. And I think it's important that you, you go ahead and use your judgment to, so that way when you talk to your boss or the upper management, whoever reviews your, your estimates, um, they understand where you're coming from. And then we always look at what we think the probability of occurrence is. I mean, that kind of factors into our matrix. We think it's, 
you know, 50-50 chance this would happen? Is it almost certain it's going to happen? Is it maybe a 10% chance likelihood, but we still, you know, we still acknowledge it as a risk? We kind of we kind of list that out because it helps us in our analysis that we'll go through in a minute of whether we accept that risk or try to push it off on the other. So, and that's my next point. Do you accept it? Do you mitigate it? Or do you assign it? And by accepting it, I mean, do you accept the risk and say, you know what, we're going to estimate it to handle that risk? Or do you mitigate it by um, getting something changed on the documents, right? Going to the engineer and owner and saying, hey, this, this is a real risky thing. Can you, can you do it this way and not this way and try to mitigate it? Or do you assign it and say, you know what, we're not going to accept this risk. You sit down with the owner and say, owner, we're not accepting this risk. And if you don't like that, either you're going to have to take the risk or we're going to walk away from the project. So there's a lot, lots of different ways to look at it. And then, of course, the reason you do all this is to develop the cost associated with the risk, right? The reason we look at risk is because we acknowledge that there's a potential cost implication to that risk. One of the big ones in the municipal world, it may not so much roads, but it's consequential damages. Anybody heard of consequential damages? Yeah, I'm sure you, yeah. We won't accept them. We will not accept consequential damage. We'll walk away from the job every time because a consequential damage is in a contract. It's in the front end documents. It's where the owner basically says, you know what? We're, anything can happen and it's your fault. It's your baby. You're responsible for it. It's like, no, we're not, we're not going to do that, right? We're not going to sit there and say any act of God or anything on the planet could happen and it, and it affects our pocketbook. So, does any part of your mitigation involve insurance? Absolutely. Yep. Risk review, insurance review. How do you utilize review. it? Risk committee, huh? How do you utilize it? What do you mean? The insurance part of your mitigation. I guess I don't understand. Maybe yeah. How are you using insurance to cover any of those contingencies? Well, our, our risk, our insurance people, and you know, I'm not an insurance guy, no, just enough to be dangerous. They'll look at the limits, they'll look at the requirements, the builder's risk, consequential damages, and they'll assess that as in whether or not our policies can even handle it. I mean, there's been sometimes we get we get policies that aren't even insurable. The owner's asking for so much. The underwriter, and we're talking big, you know, some of the big Zurichs and some of the big insurance companies in the world are like, we don't do that. We're not going to touch that. So, is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, partially. But well, you, you're not the insurance guy, so. Right, but, but it's my job to make sure that our insurance looks at it, and if they have comments or need something addressed, it goes through pre construction to get all that addressed and get it answered right. But, what are you guys doing with like lead paints, asbestos? So we have we have environmental people that assess all that and, and we try to figure out the cost to, to mitigate it if necessary. Um, so you guys are taking that responsibility on yourself. It depends. I mean, it depends on what state. I mean, it depends. Is it a design build? Yeah, we have to take that responsibility. It's factored into our proposal, right? If it's something that um, that maybe a study hasn't been done, we may ask them, "Hey, will you do the study, and then we'll we'll talk." Um, if there's nothing shown at all, then, then it goes right back to what we're talking about, your contingency, which we'll talk about in a minute. How do you, how do you cover that if, you, if there's an unknown there? You know lead paints there, you just don't know how much, right? How do you quantify that? We'll talk about that in a minute. So. Any questions on, on risk? Yeah, you understanding? I mean, it's your job as an estimator. It is. It's incumbent upon you to, to, to be that that stopgap because you're in the first line of defense. I, I, it's funny, I kind of thought about this over the years and I actually had somebody else tell me this the other day. They said, yeah, you're the first line of defense. I never had anybody else tell me that. I always thought that, but it seemed like nobody, but I can't remember who it was, but he said, yeah, you guys are the first line of defense. You need to be thinking about this stuff. And it's true. No matter what size job, what type of project, something could go wrong. And as you're an estimator, you're usually the first one looking at a set of plans, right? First one talking to an owner, first one talking to the engineer, architect. So you're the first line of defense on this stuff. So again, 50,000 or 500 million, look at the risk. It may take five minutes, it may take 50 minutes, but um, certainly look at it. So why do you do that? Because you know there's a risk and you need to figure out what's that cost. So there's a lot of different ways. Um, Types of the cost of risk can be, can be variable, right? It's quantifiable, right? You look at it and say, 
you know what, this guy's telling me there's only a thousand, it's going to take a thousand feet of height, but I know it's going to take 1,500 feet. What do I do? It's a lump sum bid. Right? There's no unit price, so what do you do? Anybody? You got a thousand, the drawing shows a thousand feet of pipe, but you know in your heart for whatever reason it's going to take 1,500. That's a lump sum bid. You can. What if the, what if the engineer says, I don't care, it's only going to take a thousand feet of pipe. I'm not changing my drawing, but you know it's going to take 1,500. What do you do? You got to quantify the risk. You got to figure out what that extra 500 feet of pipe costs and put in your price, right? Okay. So that's what I'm talking about, quantifiable, quantifiable risk. And you guys may laugh, but it happens. I've had engineers tell me, I'm not changing my plans. I know I'm right. You figure it out. Okay, price just went up. Could you, if you, you know, send that in an RFI over and then they said, no, it's a thousand and then it ends up taking more, can you use that as? ammo for a change order to get your extra costs approved if you bid it at a thousand? Could. It all goes back to the type of contract method, right? Yep. It's all tied together. You just have to, yeah, you could. About Absolutely Just could. clearing or flying it in your proposal. You could that, do that as well. That's all you have to. You could do that as well. Again, it depends on the type of proposal. Is it a GMP? Is it a lump sum? Is it a unit price? Is it 30, 60? I mean, it, it all factors in, right? It may sound like the easy way out answer, but it's, yeah. it's true. <laughs> it's true. But you still have to do quantifiable risk, right? Is it a schedule-driven risk? It, it, are they wanting you to do this in 90 days and you just know it's, it's impossible or darn near impossible and there's a risk that you may run over on time? So is it, is it a schedule-driven risk? Is it scope-related? To your point about asbestos and lead, you've got to go in and do a bunch of demo in a, in a job. They, they've got a very loose or no uh, environmental assessment or environmental study. And you know it's going to have to be done. You know the building was built in the 60s. You know it has lead paint. You just don't know how much and where. So is it scope related? Is it contract related? Right? Consequential damages, LDs. Um, you know, you get in some really high level jobs at $10,000, $25,000 a day LDs. Is that a risk you want to take? Does your ownership want to take that risk? So is it a contract related uh, risk? Or is it performance related? Are they asking you to do something with a certain piece of equipment or a certain type of paint or a certain type of air barrier system in a building, whatever, that has a performance requirement and your supplier says, we can't do that. It's impossible. What do you do, right? You gotta quantify, you gotta, so is it a performance related risk? So you gotta identify what type of risk it is to know how you're gonna price that risk. Any questions on that? Any other risk out there that I may have not touched on? Market, Market risk. That's a good one. That's a, you know what? That's an excellent one, as a matter of fact. I should have had that up there. Good point. In today's labor market, it is a huge risk. You're exactly right. Workforce today is a problem everywhere. I'm telling you, I was just in Detroit a couple weeks ago. We're pursuing a job up there, and it's, it's horrible up there. I mean, the automobile industry has come back up there, and that town's booming, and then there's no craft, and there's no people. Do anything. In St. Louis, the electrical union's telling their own brethren, the electrical subcontractors, and don't come to the hall. We don't have anybody. It's okay to go borrow somebody from our fellow electrical contractor. And that's true. That's unheard of with unions, right? So it's real. It's a real risk. That's a very good one. Appreciate that. So how do you how would how do you assess that? I mean, how do you quant how do you price that risk? Yeah. I like the commodities too. Huh? Steel. Steel. Yeah, steel wood. Price. Yeah. Yep. Materials. Materials. Well, I think I had. I think I had material. I think I had some other. But but yes. I mean, as escalation tariffs, all that. Sure. We can back up. Did I have that up there? Kind of scope related, right? Quantifiable. But yeah, to a specific point, absolutely. Material risk. Tariffs. Right. But yeah, the labor is real, real, real problem. And so what we're finding is that. You may start a job and you've got a stable workforce, but another project comes along 10 miles away and they're paying $3 or more for a labor. This guy's bit, I'm out of here. The guy down the street's paying $3 or more. I can get it. And they leave. And, I mean, it's just the way it is. It's, it's tough right now. So, any more questions on that? That was a very good one. Appreciate that. 
All right, so what does all that mean, looking at risk, estimating risk? Well, um, it's how you develop contingency. How many of you put contingency in your estimates? Show of hands. Half, maybe? And if you're not, why aren't you? Anybody? If you're not putting any, any contingency at all in your estimates, tell me why you're not. Don't see a risk. Okay. Try and get the work. That's, that's the most common reason, right? <laughs> Price. Price. Low dollar, right? Hard bid, low bid. Yeah. Sorry? Whether you're bidding or budgeting. True. So, I, me, personally, I could have seen the risk with maybe a half percent. It work out to be 3%, maybe 15%. But I don't let anything that I do, I, I put contingency in everything. Why? Because you don't know what you don't know. And it goes right back to evaluating the risk. You can evaluate the risk all day long, and something may still go wrong on that job that you never saw coming, right? That no one did. And you want that little pool. No matter if it's a big pool of money or a little pool of money, you want something there to try to offset that, right? Mitigate that, that risk. So I encourage you. And I'm not saying load your jobs up, make them fast. That's not what I'm saying at all, because you're absolutely right. Whoever said about be competitive, but yeah, I mean, this is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, right? You want to, remember, I'm wired to win. <laughs> I hate to lose. So uh, believe me, if I can trim a dollar here and there, I do the right way. But, but I still, even though I may cut something, because I think we can do it better or faster, I still have a little pool of money that I call contingency. Because okay? at the end of the day, Whoever gets your estimate, say you win the project, they're going to look at all these different tasks and they're going to budget that money and allocate it for their, for their operations, right? And they may take that contingency and do whatever they want. Well, that's their problem. That's the fact. They come back and say, hey, you lost money. Well, did I really? Or did you take my contingency and do something else? Well, you know, so um, kind of getting off subject, but have contingency in your estimate. And so that's why have it. That's why exactly right there, because it means something can go wrong in every job. And no job's perfect, am I right? Has anybody really ever had a perfect job in the field after you estimated? Yeah, you may make money, your margin may have went up at the end of the day, but was it still a perfect job? There's still ups and downs, right? You may have to pull a little bit out of your contingency to, to make that extra profit or whatever. I've never had what I would call a perfect job. I've had some very profitable ones, but I wouldn't have thought of anyone perfect. So that's why I have it. Um, when is it needed? Every time. I can give you the answer. I, I think, I just, just me personal, again, my philosophy, take it or leave it, just suggestion, just philosophy, right? Just my experience over time um, as, as to why I put contingency in, in the estimates. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about how it is developed, right? So your contingency should be a, should be a direct, somewhat direct correlation of your risk registry, right? Build your risk register, you identify your risk. We talked about whether it's, it's a quantifiable risk, is it a schedule risk. What type of risk it, it is depends on how you price it, right? If it's a schedule risk and you know you're going 30 days over and the LDs are $100 a day, you're going to put $3,000 in your contingency to handle the fact that you think you're going to go 30 days over. That makes sense? So that's why you do your risk register and that's why you identify what type of risk it is so you know how cost price that risk. Okay? So that's how it's developed. You want to make sure it's definable, right? your contingency. I've had so many, I, I, we've got, not to digress a whole lot, but we've got what we call the owner's advisor services for a client in Denver, uh, a water, municipal water agency, and they, they're going through a CMGC contract, and they had trouble, and they knew, they knew one of the guys I work with, a PM on the engineering side, and they, and they called him and said, hey, can you help us? He said, sure. So they hired us to be their owner's advisor to help them through the pre-construction and getting to a GMP uh, on a project. And the contractor walked in with his, with his risk register. I looked at it. They were good risks, right? They were all, hey, I'm good with that, that, that. Then I looked at the dollar amounts. It was 25000 25000 25000 25000 25000 I went, okay, let's have a talk. There was no thought put in. There was thought put into the risks, but they didn't know how to price the risk. They had no clue. So he had like winter protection was one of his risks, right? They were worried about scheduling. If they got in the concrete, doing concrete in the winter time to facilitate the project, they were worried about winter protection. There's not a lot of concrete in this job. I mean, like 100 yards, okay? And the guy had $25,000 for, for winter protection. I said, well, how do you price that? Well, just based on experience. I said, well, 
my experience tells me it's only seven dollars a yard or so much a square foot and he just kind of looked at me you know and, and i wasn't trying to be a smart ass i was just trying to get him to think that hey when you, my point to all this is when you when you come to an owner with your contingency make it real have it definable right track back to it just don't throw something at it because a smart savvy owner look at that and go well how'd you come up with that dollar now and then you look like a fool if you don't can't back it up right but if you walk in and say doggone it your schedule's too tight it's 30 days short you're assessing me a hundred dollars a day so i put three thousand dollars a day all these on this is why and here's my schedule you guys gonna look and say hey you know you really thought this through you may not agree with it but i understand it does that make sense a savvy owner will see through see right through your contingency all day long if you're not able to quantify it and justify it make it definable so that's my next point, make it quantifiable. Uh, I mean, if you look at that little example, this is, this is actually a risk register I did for this job in Detroit. It's very rudimentary, it's a $20 million job. We had zero plans. The owner had a budget of $18 million to do this thermal biosolids drying process in their wastewater treatment plan. They said, hey, validate our estimate. We will have to go, where do we even start? Have an $18 million budget, no data. All we know is it's this type of equipment. So we just used our experience and went through and said, okay, we know we're going to have to do this, this, and this. And then based on that, we developed this initial risk register to show the owner that we valid when we validated their budget, how we arrived at our contingency, right? So make sure it's quantifiable. And then like we talked about, make sure it's justifiable. Right? And sometimes, sometimes, you know, you put that just that 1% in there for unknown. <coughs> And, and the owner said, well, why is that in there? Say, well, look, there's going to be stuff that happens. I know it's just going to happen, right? But if you go in with a 25% contingency and none of it's quantifiable, definable, or justifiable, you're going to get laughed out of the room. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? All right. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. Um, Another topic that I think is, is sometimes not mentored or passed down or discussed very much in estimating, and at least my experience early in my career was worked for a company where the owner just said what he wanted, right? That's how much he wanted a job, that's how much he wanted. Well, these days I think things are a little more evolved and um, a little more complicated, so there are, there's a method of madness to developing GCs and, and overhead and margin. Anybody have any, does anybody know what GCs are? Can you explain to me what, what we mean by GCs? General conditions, sorry. Right. Anybody know what general conditions are? Or overhead? No, it's not an overhead projector, sorry. Try to find it. <laughs> I lack humor sometimes, I try. So here's some definitions. So your general conditions, um, are the costs incurred during a project that generally don't involve swinging a hammer or installing something permanently. So, um, in other words, your job trailers, right? Your temporary fencing, the uh, security fencing you get to put around your laydown yard, developing your laydown yard if you have one, putting your aggregate down, your geogrid or your fabric, um, your porta potties, your dumpsters, right? Maybe a new computer for your superintendent. Maybe a new computer for you, <laughs> right? depending on if you're on site or not, um, printing expenses, you know, all those things that are necessary for a project to happen, but aren't directly related to the work you're doing. Does that make sense? Okay, overhead. And, and be careful, because I hear, I've heard overhead and general conditions interchange a lot of the years, and they're, they're different, they're two different things. General conditions are, are directly related to your project, to that specific project, but they're not direct project costs or indirect costs. In other words, they're not directly related to the work you're performing. There's stuff that's needed to manage the process, right? Manage the people, organize the work, that type of stuff. That's, that's general conditions. Overhead is what your company needs to stay in business, right? It's the percentage of, it's your, and I think I'll listen to that here, it's your uh, legal, right? It's your, it's your marketing, it's your president, vice president, it's your admin staff, it's your home office cost, it's your utilities, 
and stuff at the home office building. All that stuff rolls in is a cost to the company that has to be reimbursed, so to speak, or absorbed somehow, right? So if you aren't figuring overhead in your project, then your company's not, your company's losing money, right? Because they're paying for that stuff, but you're not recuperating that cost and giving it a budget to be able to pay for it. So does that make sense? So a lot of you probably have, I see Turner here, Black Beach, I know you guys, they've told you, hey, this is our overhead, right? Percentage. Anybody else? Your ownership has told you this is what we need to operate, right? 6%, 7%, whatever that is, 8%, I've seen it vary, sometimes it's 4 or 5 but generally in our industry at IC, it's 6 to 8%. Uh, overhead's pretty common, so some people have more, a little less. So. All that makes sense? Has anybody ever questioned the overhead? All the time. I almost got fired once because I got so pissed, I was like, there's no way we can stay in business with 10% overhead. Like, you're kidding me, how do you expect me to get a job at 10% overhead? I kept arguing and said, oh, I swear it's 10% overhead. I was like, there's no way. I just, I looked around and looked at the number of people that were in the office. I mean, you know, I couldn't get an idea. But, but it's important. You have to have it, right? Your company has to pay for the expenses it needs to operate. So there's that overhead, but do you, uh, I guess, how would you, if you're self-performing some of the work, how would you have that labor burden? Is that included in that overhead, or how is that? So generally, we just put the overhead, well, if you're doing T&M work, absolutely. Your labor rates have to have your overhead embedded in that, right? So you gotta mm -hmm. convert that percentage to an hourly rate, however you would do that, however your company would wanna do that. But if it's a lump sum bid, we just typically put our overhead as a bottom line type factor. Gotcha. Right? Okay. We don't, we, yeah, we don't go through. Now, I say that, Burns Mac has a lot of different types of estimating. I mean, trades, right? We have oil and gas, we have does we have all kinds of stuff. And the oil and gas guys, because of the nature of that work, they do roll all that into the labor rate mm. in the field, the craft labor rate. But in, in our water space, we just know what our GCs, what our, sorry, what our overhead needs to be as a percentage, right? And make sure we capture that. So it's a couple, yeah, so to answer your question, you can do it either way. Okay. I think it depends on the type of contract you're looking at, and if it's hourly work, TM work. Because one of the problems we found with doing it by labor hour is it's hard to track how much actual money is there. Does that make sense? If you do it by percentage, you're, you're covered, right? Yeah. If you do it by labor hour, what if you don't have as many labor hours as you can, as you, you're not covering all your you can overdo it. Theoretically. Yeah. Theoretically. Yeah. I, I got you. That makes sense? Anybody understand that? A little sidebar? <laughs> Um, so overhead is very important, and, and like I said, most of your ownership from companies you work for sort of told you what that needs to be. And then there's margin or profit. I hear a fee, I hear margin, I hear profit, I hear all of it. I prefer margin for whatever reason, because profit just sounds so greedy to me. Sorry. I like margin. It just has a little more sophistication to it. So, And that's simply what we talked about earlier. That's the difference between your cost and your price, right? It's how much money do you want to make on this job. It's really what it boils down to. Because you're already covering how much you need to make in your overhead, right? So you're assessing the overhead as a cost then? More an indirect cost, yeah. It's a, it's a cost of doing business. Yeah. Yeah. I know some people will say it's just 15% and then you pull your overhead out of that number. Yeah, we, we don't do it that way. We, we make sure our overhead's covered and then how much do we need to make above the right. Anybody else? Is you point on that? Is there another thought process or another way that People are looking at it. And do, you, does your, do your companies have a minimum amount they want on every job? Do they say, hey, we're not, we're not going to bid this job or, or try to win it unless we get at least get this much profit per job? Metric, does that we, metric we use yeah. is uh, depending on the level of superintendent, we have to make so much per month on a superintendent because the money flows through him. But if you're not making enough profit or margin on that, there's no reason to do the project. Interesting. Has anybody ever heard of looking at how much your profit is as a percent of your labor as a metric? Has anybody ever heard of that? That's a risk analysis. It's another way of looking at risk. <laughs> exactly. risk so I live, per, and this is personal, um, and, and somewhat based on experience, but I've, had, I've worked for companies that have had other opinions, and that's what we go by. But personally, well, I always look at 50% of labor. 
if my margin is not covering at least at least 50% of my labor costs, then I'm taking too much risk. Preferably, you'd like your margin to be 100% of labor. In other words, if your labor is 100,000 and your mar and your margin is 100,000, if you doubled your labor and really screwed up the estimate, right? You're really dummy that day and weren't thinking and you missed something, or or it's just a tough job and you couldn't execute it. It's not always our fault, right? Yeah, right. Um, you're double, you provided the cushion of double your labor. Right? Does that make sense? So that would be 100% of your labor is. So I always look at 50% of labor. So in other words, if I had a job at 100,000 in, in labor, I would want at least 50,000 in margin. And why is that? It's because I honestly don't think I'm ever gonna miss a job that bad. No, I'm just being honest. I mean, you gotta, you gotta be honest with yourself at some point, right? You keep adding money and adding money and adding money to an estimate that you'll never get a job if you do that. So you've got to have certain metrics you go by. One company I know uh, looks at 33% of labor, which is you know, a little more risky, right? A little more aggressive. But that's, they're comfortable with that, and that's fine. It's so whatever you're comfortable in, your management, your company, your executives, yourself. It's whatever you're, and, and some people don't even look at, look at it that way. But, but we do, we want to make sure our margins at least and that's not how we calculate it, but at the end of the day, once all your labor's done and you see that bottom dollar number, you want to make sure that's at least 50% of your labor. That's what you're the metric you're looking at, the way we look at it, if we do commercial work and self-perform work. You know, commercial work, 80% of what you're doing is subcontracted in, in materials. So your labor way doesn't down. fall. That's why you've got to look at yep. how much money you're going to get if it's a small project, how much you're turning per month. Yep. But on self-perform project, I look at the direct labor. My management doesn't really use the effect if I go over my direct labor goes over. So I look at it, the direct labor. Especially on a smaller project, I look at what my cost per day is. Absolutely, yeah, that's a good point. And, and the reason I just brought that example about labor is because you're right, that would be for a typical company that would self-perform, right? If you're a, just a GC and you're subbing 90% of the work, that metric will not work. Because the only labor you're gonna have is a superintendent and your labor running around. So if you had, 50%, that's not very much margin, right? Um, get 50% of that cost of labor. So uh, that example I use is just because of the world I live in and the amount of labor that some of the types of projects we do. So that's not a, I didn't intend that to be an end all be all, it's just a typical metric I would look at. But develop your own, right? Over time, you'll learn, trust me, you will learn. If you pay attention to bid results and spreads, and, and where you're at on certain things, you will start to you will start to see trends. You absolutely will. I can tell you right now, I've been most successful in the water wastewater industry with a combined GC profit margin of 16 to 18 percent. I can compete at that level all day long. I get up around 21 percent. Last, right? High bidder. I've just learned that metric over time. There's just a and, and you can you can see trends. If you pay attention. Act. You know, I'm sure you all get your bid tabs, right? Your bid results. Maybe some of you don't, depending on what type of work you're bidding your sub and you're bidding strictly to Turner and they won't give you their bid results, I'm just kidding. But um, some GCs don't want to tell you where you fell and I understand that, I think that gets hard. But if you have that ability to get that information, you, you'll see trends over time, you will. You won't see in the first four or five because there'll be a huge swing. One time you'll be maybe way low, one time you may be way high, but over a long period of time, you can start to see little trends and stuff. And so, you know, it's just personal experience. It's not a hard and, hard and true number. Don't live by that, please. <laughs> so don't go in and say, hey, Birds Max said, dude, this is like, No, no, that's not, not what I'm saying. That's just me personal experience. You said that 16 to 18 was GCs plus overhead? Overhead margin, okay. not GCs. That's right, overhead margin, got yeah. it. And, and for that particular type of thing. Right. That's kind of the thing I've seen. Again, that's just personal observation. Another company may have looked at me and seen it differently. I, I know I can be, I'm not saying I win every job, but I know I can be competitive and at least be in the game if I'm in that, if at the end of the day, and I don't shoot for that by any stretch. Uh, so, so I guess that's a little off topic, but I don't ever shoot for any particular metric. I let the estimate do the work, right? Put, do the estimate, do it right, do what's there, and then look at the metrics. Does that make sense? Like, like cubic yards, uh, man hours per cubic yard for concrete. I know on a wastewater treatment plant, if you're between five and six man hours per cubic yard, you're probably gonna be in the game, right, for the concrete portion. 
But I don't shoot for that. I let the takeoff and I let the productions that I think are appropriate do the, do the work. And then at the end of the day, when I'm all said and done, I back check against that metric to see if I'm an eight man average QPR or three. If I'm a three, I got a problem. And I go back to my estimate and I look and say, okay, where I screwed up. Because I know three man average for QPR is way too cheap. That make sense? Yeah. Sorry to digress here. We kind of got off topic. But, um, everybody understand now GC's overhead margin? How are we on time? Uh, we'll pick this up a little bit. So we kind of already talked about this. I guess I should have fast forwarded on the slide, sorry. Uh, you know, your general conditions, your job trailers, temp power, portable tow other signs, et cetera. You know, overheads, your business operating costs, executive staff, home office, we already talked about all this. Uh, margin is the minimum amount of money needed for your profitability. Again, it differs by industry, differs by trade, right? And by type of work. It also makes a difference if you're doing labor, and we didn't touch on this, so we'll talk about this just for a minute. How many of you do labor-only type estimator contracts? Anybody at all? Sometimes? Do you put more margin on it? For the labor, yeah. yeah. So if you say, I'm just throwing numbers out there. If you had a job and you had materials, you might be 15, but if it's just labor, you might go 25, right? And why? Okay, okay. Good. Why, though? Because there's risk, right? There's more risk in just a labor-only contract, so you're going to mark that up higher, right? You, take, you don't have the cushion, exactly what you said. You don't have the cushion, that extra margin in, on top of materials. So just got into this discussion with somebody on electrical gear, $6 million in electrical gear, and, and we've got one group that wants to buy it and another group that doesn't, and we, I'm in the group that doesn't because I'm, I tell, I, I'm, I'm of the belief and the opinion that the electrical contractor is going to know how much the gear costs, and they're going to put that markup in their bid one way or another, because you're taking that away from them, right? You're taking that additional, you're adding more risk because it becomes more of a labor-only contract. They're going to call the electrical manufacturer and say, hey, how much does this cost? Okay. You're going to pay for it anyway, so why take the risk of buying the electrical gear? I just had this discussion, so anyway. Good point. Good, good point there. So I guess we are, we are at the end though. So um, just quick overview, you know, estimate types, we talked about learning maybe different ways to have in your arsenal, whether it's the unit price or looking up what RS means or your personal experience or developing your own database. Um, learn, learn different ways to estimate, it'll help you down the road. Uh, and then also, if you can develop your own little database. So I, I at first, early in my career, I did not keep all my estimates for the last 10 or 15 years. I've kept every estimate I've done. All right? And that, that's my little database. Right, wrong, and different, whether I won the job or not, sometimes just having already estimated something and five years later you come back and it happens. You may not see something for five years and all of a sudden, oh man, I know I've done that before, right? Instead of reinventing the wheel, pull out your database. And then having your format. How, how do you want to estimate, right? And we talked about processes with having procedure, again, format, how do you want to estimate, and cost and schedule, and how those two are, are linked from the very beginning. And then uh, the GC's overhead margin. Right? So, any other questions? Was this useful, helpful? Um, I, know, I, I know the title of this was, in, and I took it a little different way, and I probably should have told them I was going to do that. I think if you want intermediate takeoffs, go see the BIM presentation, because that's where it's all headed. Right? It, it, just so you know, real quick, Burns and Mac, we are looking at ways to, uh, and we, we're looking at Sage, Timberline, in conjunction with Assemble, in conjunction with E-Takeoff, in conjunction with the Revit or M360, but we're, look, we're looking at ways because we do a lot of stuff. We do a lot of progressive design builds. Do you even know what progressive design build is? You know, you, you, progressive design build is you're selecting on your qualifications only. You're not selecting on price, but you have to get to a very early 30% GMP or some 30 or 60. A lot of what we're doing is we're going in and giving the GMP at 30%, which is risky, right? In order to do that, you have to have some level of design, and the easiest way to do that is using a bin line at this point, instead of having engineers trying to crank out 2D drawings. So we're not there yet, but we're trying to get to the point where we can actually develop our estimates and create our estimate. I wouldn't say work breakdown structure, but maybe pull the main elements, the main breakdown of our estimate directly from a BIM model into an estimating software and then fill in that detail based on our knowledge and experience. Pull the main items of work 
and the main quantities that can be tracked in a BIM model. Because in a 300 level BIM model, again, I know nothing about BIM. Don't you know what a 300 level model is? You just heard that term and know that it's a very low level BIM model, right? But at a low level BIM model, there's only so many things you can track. You can only track cubic yards of concrete or linear foot of pipe. You can't go in and track water stop or you're not going to track aggregate base or you're not going to track trim, floor trim. You're just not, it's not, that level of detail is not there and it's not practical. So you'd be able to take those larger buckets of work, concrete walls, concrete slabs, concrete decks, 48 inch pipe, whatever, and, and develop your estimate. So I encourage you if you have, I think was that this morning or is there another round of that BIM? Things are headed that way in the real world. I'm not saying that everybody's going to do that, but it's, it's definitely definitely turning that way. And it won't be an end-all be-all, it won't be the only way to develop an estimate, but it'll be another tool in our tool, tool belt, right? I was hoping they could make for that. I didn't, honestly, I, I need one more battle. We're trying to, we're trying to get up to speed, so. Any other questions? Well, I really appreciate everybody's interest. This is a great turnout, so hopefully uh, you learned a little something today. And, um, if you didn't get a copy of the presentation or the hard and you want one, just leave me a business card about it, I'll make sure to email you PDF.